You know, I've always had, I've always had an interesting relationship with the future. I've always had an interesting relationship with the things that hadn't happened yet. I'll give you an example. I remember back in high school, back in high school, I started to think things like, am I, am I behind the eight ball on this? Am I, uh, am I not going to be prepared for college? I need to go. I need to get myself a job. Let's get out there. I need to start making some money because I need to pay for college. Then I'm going to need to uh, be ready to provide for a family if uh, God gives me the opportunity to ask this young lady, Emily, to marry me. And uh, I got to go start making some money. And so I did. I, I went and I got a job at a rental store at the south end of Yorkville. I don't know if you've ever been there. I think I've got a picture of about what that place looked like and and I would go there and I would clean equipment and I would clean out the cotton candy machine and I would power wash the all the white folding chairs that somebody used in a muddy yard for their wedding and uh, and I would clean equipment and I would set up those big bounce houses and wipe them down with simple green because that's what our boss wanted us to use and and roll it back up and stick it back in that bag, which was a tremendous challenge to get that thing back in the bag where it came from, but that was the job. And so, so I worked hard, and I, and I was trying to make the money and, and be prepared for college, going off to Moody Bible Institute. And, uh, and I had this view of the future that, hey, if things are going to turn out in the future, I had better take charge of things right now. And I think now that I look back on it, I was probably living my life with my perspective toward the future more from a place of anxiety than I realized. What's your relationship been with the future? As you look towards the things that haven't happened yet, as you have, uh, in a sense, those uh, um, proverbial binoculars that you're looking and saying, okay, what are things going to look like over there? Some of us have different approaches when it comes to the future. Now, you may be the kind of person that could go, and on a sunny Saturday like yesterday, you could say, today is the day I'm going fishing, going to the river, I'm going to the pond, I'm going to get out there, and I'm going to spend all day fishing, relaxing, decompressing, enjoying the presence of the moment, not with a care in the world about tomorrow. Maybe that's your natural point of view for the future. Maybe you're the person who says, all right, I've got to figure out all my plans for the coming years. I've got financial charts that I've got put together. I've got goals for the future, five-year, 10-year, 20-year goals. I've got a plan for everything down the road. I am ready to go, and I want to know how the future is going to unfold. Or maybe you're the type of person who, in your walk with God, you have come to a place where you say, you know what? God's in control. God takes care of me. I know he's in charge. And as a result, my motto is, I'm too blessed to be stressed. Too blessed to be stressed. That's a good place to be as well. Well, as we come to God's word, we can ask this question, God, what do you say about the future? God, what's your perspective about the things that haven't happened yet in my life? And today in Daniel chapter 12, as we close out this series in Daniel... We're going to uncover God's plan for the future. We're going to uncover some of the things that God has revealed to us that are in store. He's given us an outlook that we can say, all right, this is the way I'm going to be looking at the future with my future binoculars. So today we're going to uncover three God-revealed facts about the future that can give you confidence. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, and we know that you know the future. We don't know it. We don't know what's around the corner. There are things we may be worried about, things we may be concerned about or, or wondering about, and, and Lord, those are not things you revealed to us right now. But Lord, we know that you know all things. So Lord, as we look to the future, uh, not only for our lives, but also for the end of history and the, the things of end times and what it will look like for your son Jesus to return, God, we anticipate the fulfillment of all your promises to us. God, I ask that you would please speak to us by your word, bring your transforming work into our hearts and minds. And God, we pray all these things in the, in the power of the Spirit and in the name of your son Jesus. All God's people said, 
Amen. Amen. So, yes, here as we conclude the book of Daniel, uh, God reaffirms his sovereignty over all things, including the future. I told you we've got three facts, and, and I want to share with you the first one. The first fact that we're going to draw out of Daniel chapter 12 is this. The future holds a time of tribulation for the world. The future holds, one of the things that's coming down the line is a time of great, great trouble and tribulation for the world. The story is told of a man who lived out on Long Island, Long Island excuse me, a number of years ago, and he purchased for himself a fine barometer. He wanted to be able to look and see, this was back in the 1930s, went out and got a barometer, wanted to be able to know, hey, what's going on with the pressure in uh, the atmosphere and all that stuff? So he, he bought this barometer, he brought it home, and uh, he started looking at it, and uh, the needle was pointing in the direction that said hurricane. And he's like, well, that can't be right, okay? And he's shaking the thing and trying to figure out what's going on with it, and he realizes that he thinks he's gotten a defective barometer. And he writes this kind of scathing letter and sends it off to the place where he had bought it. And uh, he would went and dropped it off uh, the next day on his way to work. And as he came home, he was surprised to see that when he got home, not only was the barometer gone, but his entire house was gone. Because that barometer had actually been correct and there was a great hurricane, Category 5, in 1938 that was one of the deadliest and most destructive tropical cyclones ever to hit the United States. Doing damage of $300 million, highest weeds, uh, uh, wind speed of 162, almost 800 fatalities. And right there in front of him, there was a warning. Something dangerous, something bad is coming. And Jesus, I've actually got a picture here of, uh, of the news there. Uh, at that point, they had only counted up a, a limited number of people who had been killed. But uh, what, a, what a terrible thing going on in here. I don't know if you noticed, but down here at the bottom, there's a, he uh, there's a headline about some of the things that Hitler has going on in 1938. And uh, I guess... Uh, I mentioned that by way of the fact that last week we talked about the Antichrist and the Antichrist who will happen along the way. And uh, it's true, there are evildoers in our world. But there is a tribulation that's coming. And, and in our passage today, in Daniel chapter 12, I want to set the stage for you. We've walked through Daniel, and the first six chapters of Daniel were very specific, real-life stories of God's sovereignty in situation after situation. Daniel and his friends decided, no, we're not going to eat the king's food. Instead, we're going to seek to live in a way that honors our God, and God honored them and blessed them with supernatural, I believe, supernatural strength and wisdom as a result. Under the threat of death, Daniel and his friends not only passed through the fiery furnace, but the lion's den, because they said, no, we're going to do things God's way. We also saw people like Nebuchadnezzar, who was so prideful and thought, okay, look at all these amazing things that I have done. I surely am so amazing. But then he was humbled, and God said, you're going to lose all your uh, human faculties, and you're going to live like an animal for a number of years until you come to your senses and you look back to me and recognize my sovereignty. That's exactly what happened with that king. And so we see in the very beginning of Daniel all these very personal real life stories. And then we see for the second half of the book a number of prophecies or a number of visions and revelations that were given to Daniel. And as a result of these things that were revealed to him, he knew some of the things that were going to come, some of the different events of history that would unfold. And for Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12, the final three chapters, Daniel chapter 10 is purely devoted to helping Daniel have the strength that he needs to be able to hear the vision in chapter 11. This angel comes and comforts Daniel, encourages him, says, come on, get up, it's all right, I'm going to give you some courage so you can hear. And in Daniel chapter 11, there is a character who appears 
at the Tigris River, Babylon, this city where Daniel had been living, was right on the banks of the Tigris River, one of the two great rivers there in Mesopotamia, the Tigris and Euphrates. And Daniel's there on the banks of the river, trying to figure out, God, are your prophecies going to come true? Your people are not doing well. Jerusalem and your temple are not doing well. And, and Daniel's wondering, and suddenly there appears a figure, a heavenly figure, they're floating above the Tigris River. And I told you over the last few weeks, I believe that this character is Jesus. It's Jesus showing up before he was born in Bethlehem. He's a glorious figure. He's got uh, this power and radiance coming out of him. Things like lightning, the words that come out of his mouth are like a roaring multitude. He's an absolutely glorious figure. That's why Daniel needed such encouragement to be able to stand back up. And so over the course of 11, we, we heard about all the different kingdoms, the major kingdoms that would happen. And last week, we heard about the Antichrist. And this week, we're closing out the book with the final words of this character that I believe is Jesus to Daniel. Daniel's got some questions. And one of the things that I believe Jesus has to share with him is, hey, there's going to be a time of tribulation in our world. And here's how Jesus describes that in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. It says this. At that time, now we're going to hear the word time four times in this verse, so it's very uh, uh, chronology oriented. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. Let me explain that. God hasn't given us within Scripture a definitive and exhaustive description of how all the angelic forces all work together. But at different places, we see clues as to how things work together. And from this verse, we see, okay, here's an angel named Michael, and it seems that he is a, he's a, an archangel. He is above other angels, and his specific role is to look out for oversee the care of God's people, the nation of Israel, and that may even extend to the redeemed from other nations as well. But here's Michael, the great prince or ruler who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble. We would call this the tribulation. That seven-year period when the Antichrist and a false prophet will be antagonizing and persecuting Christians. There shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But God also has some good news in that. He says there's going to be a tribulation. It's going to be so bad. It's going to be so difficult and painful. People being killed. People being marginalized. But he says, but at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be written in the book of life. No matter how bad this tribulation gets, Jesus tells Daniel, God's people will be protected in the end. There is hope and a future for these individuals. And I love how it describes that everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. The book of life, the one that proclaims all those who have been saved by Jesus. So I've got a question for you. Are you ready for the tribulation? Are you ready for that great time of trouble? To those of us who love our creaturely comforts and we like being able to sit in that chair, that couch that just fits us just right and catch up on our episodes and, and go out to eat and have a great meal and and come to church on a Sunday, leisurely walking in, have a great greeting time, not looking out the windows, worrying if any of the authorities are going to come after us. The time of tribulation sounds like a very foreign thing. But for the believers of God around the world in different persecuted nations, they are very familiar with this perspective. We don't know when it is that the Antichrist will show up on the scene. We don't know when it is that he will begin to oppress God's people. But the question I have for you is, are you ready? Or are you getting ready? Does your faith in God, your faith in Jesus, your relationship with him, does that rise and fall 
on your circumstances. Hey, things are going great. My refrigerator's full. My bank account is full. I'm ready for anything that I, I need to do. Does your faith rise and fall on your circumstances, or does it hold firm in Christ and his promises to be with us and to sustain us even in persecution? I encourage you, be ready for whenever it is that the hurricane will hit. I want to share with you a quote from uh, an anonymous church leader. Uh, for reasons of not uh, experiencing persecution, this anonymous church leader shares these words from central China. He says, We are constantly on edge, but our faith has grown, and we are more determined than ever to see Christians in the area stand strong and not compromise their faith in Jesus. That's amazing. Their request, their hope, their prayer of their heart is that they would stand strong in persecution. Not that life would get easier, not that they could open up the churches and everything be a whole lot easier. Their hope is that they would stand strong in their faith and not compromise. That's a tremendous perspective to have in the face of persecution. So there is a tribulation coming, and, and that's the bad news. But we know God will sustain us. God will provide victory in the end for his people. But is there any good news that's coming from this character floating there above the Tigris River? The answer is yes, there is some very good news. And the second thing I want you to write down in your notes is this. The future holds resurrection to eternal life for God's Redeem. Not only does the future hold a tribulation that will be very difficult for the world, but the future also holds resurrection to eternal life for God's redeemed people. You know, I like to be careful about the promises that I make to my kids because I really don't like letting down my kids. I don't like, uh, you know, not being able to come through on promises. And so when um, a few weeks ago, one of my kids woke up and said, Dad, I... I had this dream about these certain toys, and do you think we could order them? Do you think we could get these from the store? And I thought, well, that sounds good. Let's, let's look into it, and, and we may be able to get that down the road. Let's see if some things line up, and, and we were able to end up getting it, and, and what a great time that has been. Or my kids on the way home uh, yesterday from some of the things that we were doing, they said, hey, Dad, since it's such nice weather outside, could we, could we break out the hose? Can we spray each other? And, and since we're taking a shower tonight anyway, could we uh, just play out there? I said, that sounds like a great plan. Let's go plan on doing that. Careful with the promises. Now, one thing that my kids love asking about is this next picture right here. We love getting out to Dairy Queen. Dad, can we, can we get some ice cream? And so I've kind of started this tradition, which is if we are ending up going to a Dairy Queen, is that uh, I'll kind of act like the car is malfunctioning. Uh, what's happening? What's happening? I don't know. Our car's, oh my goodness, how do we find ourselves at Dairy Queen? And, uh, and then we'll enjoy some ice cream. And for those of you who know that I can't have dairy, they've got a dairy-free dilly bar that, uh, that I've been eating over there. So those are pretty good. But here's the thing. Jesus doesn't hold back with the promises that he makes to his people. He doesn't hold back. He's got some very strong, otherwise impossible promises that Jesus says, I've got this promise for you. Jesus there declares to Daniel, hey, the people who have died, those people who are laying down in the dust of the earth, their bodies are there, those people are going to be raised back to life. And they're going to be raised back to life either to eternal life or to eternal contempt. I want to read for you what, uh, what I believe it is Jesus declares in verse 2. He says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame. And everlasting contempt. And those who are wise, those people who are looking at the world through God's eyes because he's worked in their hearts, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. 
and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Those people who are truly serving God and have received his gift of salvation will live forever in God's glory. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. What an incredible promise that is. The promise that, hey, there is a resurrection. So for those of us who are believers, as we pass away, our body remains here. Our soul, we know Jesus proclaimed to the thief on the cross who, who said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. And so we believe that our souls will go and will be with God the moment we pass away. Our souls will be with him and our bodies will be here. But when Jesus comes back, those bodies will be resurrected, will be rejoined with our souls. We believe we will meet Jesus in the clouds and I think it's going to work a little bit like this, that we're going to go up and we'll be with him, we'll join with him in the clouds, and we are going to, just like those people on Palm Sunday who uh, proclaimed Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, who ushered Jesus in as that a humble king, we will join with him in the sky and we will, I believe, usher Jesus in as he comes to establish his thousand-year reign. His thousand-year uh, millennial kingdom that will be here, uh, a real uh, kingdom on this earth that will happen. After that, of course, uh, Satan will be let loose for a short time, will be defeated definitively and cast into the lake of fire. Uh, my family and I were actually singing a song. We went and saw there's a new movie out called... Uh, Unsung Hero. Anyone seen that movie yet? It's a great movie. Go check it out. It's the story of uh, Rebecca St. James and uh, the guys from For King and Country. And one of the songs is a striper song that says, uh, To Hell with the Devil. That's the name of the song. And so we were singing that. They said, Dad, is, is that okay to sing? It's a Christian song. I said, well, that's, that's God's plan. So uh, all right, we'll be careful maybe how we, how we, who we sing that song around. But uh, it's true. That's God's plan is to cast all the forces of evil into the lake of fire. Brothers and sisters, as you are confronted with the threat of death, I just got an email this morning about a, about a friend who's been hospitalized, and it looks like it may be the end. As we're confronted with this problem of death, if you're a redeemed believer in Jesus Christ, you don't have to fear because you will be with Jesus because your body will be resurrected on the last day. But if you don't yet know Jesus, if you've never bowed the knee and said, Jesus, I need you to be my Savior. I need you to be my master in life and for all eternity. I confess my sin and God, I admit I'm a sinner and I need your help. Would you please save me? If you've never taken that step to become a redeemed follower of Jesus, then the threat of death, the fear of everlasting contempt, is something that still hangs over your head. I encourage you to go to God and to receive the free gift of salvation that he gives to us. I've got a quote for you uh, from uh, my favorite author of all time, uh, he's the author of, uh, of all creation, the author of the Word of God. He is the Word of God himself. And in John, uh, he says to his friend Martha, after Lazarus has passed away, Jesus declares to her, he says, Martha, I know, well, uh, I'll just give you the context. Martha says, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother Lazarus would not have died. And Jesus declares to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. She knew it. She had been reading her Bible. And in verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. God has a resurrection planned for his redeemed. That's a great joy and a hope, not only when we are around those who are near death's door, not only when we attend a funeral, 
but as we live our lives each day knowing the battle has already been won. Amen? Amen. So God's got a resurrection plan for the redeemed that will happen down the line. But you may be sitting here and you're like, okay, pastor, that's nice. That's good news. I'm looking forward to not dying but being resurrected. That's going to be great. But do you have anything for me today, pastor? Do you have anything that will help me today as I seek to walk in confidence? Is there any marching orders that I can uh, seek to live out this week? And the last thing I want you to write down, the third fact that we find in Daniel chapter 12 is this. The future is held by a God we can trust who fulfills his promises with perfect timing. Lunchtime today, dinner time tonight, those plans we have for two weeks from now, the goals that you have for your children, hopefully they're going to marry somebody who loves the Lord, hopefully they're going to go to college or find a career where they'll be able to thrive and carry out their passions. Hopefully my retirement funds are going to pan out. Everything's going to be just right for the time I need to, to retire and be cared for. All these plans that we have for the future, we can trust every last thing to our God because he fulfills his promises with perfect timing. Do we have any uh, Lord of the Rings fans in the house? Anybody here like some Lord of the Rings? All right, I love some Lord of the Rings and um, we need to have some more hands going up, all right? That's a, good, that's a good show. I just heard the good news. They're remastering and re-releasing into theaters the extended versions of Lord of the Rings in June. And so my sabbatical, I'm going to go kick off with a marathon of uh, Lord of the Rings in the theaters. And, uh, and I'm hopefully, we'll pray for them. I'm going to try to be passing along uh, that legacy to my kids, have them come with me as well. But one of the things I love in Lord of the Rings, there's a lot of different characters. It is kind of a fantasy story. And there are a number of different kind, kinds of, of people or characters. There are, are hobbits that are very short, they have curly hair, and they don't wear any shoes. They just have these big feet that they run around, and that's the hobbits. Then there are dwarves, and they typically have beards, both the men and the women, okay? There's the dwarves. Then there are uh, people. There are people, and uh, they're about as tall as me, all right? And there are people just like us, men, uh, particularly susceptible to some of the temptations of, of power and things like that. Then there are elves. Elves are a little taller, and they live for like hundreds of years, these elves. They're really good at lots of different things. And then there are, my arm's not long enough, there are wizards. There's only a few. There's only a few wizards, but there's one particular wizard named Gandalf. Gandalf's this great, loving character. He's kind of a nurturing guy. He, he cares about people, and as a wizard, he's got some powers to be able to kind of help out all the different people that need his help. And so at the very beginning of one of the, the, of the first movie, The Fellowship of the Ring, Frodo, one of those uh, short hobbits, he's there and he's waiting for Gandalf to show up. He's waiting, he's reading a book, and finally, I've got it right behind me, Gandalf shows up in his cart, and Frodo says, you're late. And Gandalf says, a wizard is never late, Frodo Baggins, nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. And the, the author of the Lord of the Rings is, is a Christian, and he wrote it to illustrate many Christian truths that we know. And one of the things that you need to know about Gandalf is that he, as he's fighting for the well-being, as he's there fighting against, I think it's called the Balrog, this big, fiery, demonic guy with, like, horns. He's, like, gigantic. And this thing is chasing after these people. And Gandalf stands in between them and says, You shall not pass. Shortly after that moment, Gandalf is struck by the weapon and he starts falling down this great chasm. He's falling and falling and falling and he's fighting and it seems that in the end, he sacrifices his life to care for the rest of this fellowship. And so a little bit later on, there's this terrible moment at, uh, is it the Battle of Helm's Deep. Gandalf, you got me, am I right? Battle of Helm's Deep. They're over there, and the, the war, the battle, seems like it's being lost. 
The people are in despair. But suddenly, who shows up? Not Gandalf the Grey, but I've got a picture right here of Gandalf the White. Gandalf uh, seemingly comes back from the dead. Now he's in a different form, a glorious form. And he doesn't say this right there, but it's true. A wizard is never late, nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. And this resurrected Gandalf is able to go and deliver uh, victory for those people he's caring for. And Gandalf is supposed to be a picture of Jesus. Jesus is, is caring for us, and, and he goes to the cross, and he dies for us, and he comes back in a, in a more glorious state, revealing even more of his glory, showing his victory. And the thing, uh, the whole reason I told you all this is because the future is held by a God we can trust who fulfills his promises with perfect timing. Jesus is never late. He arrives precisely when he means to. Now Daniel and uh, some of the angels who are there, so picture this, Daniel's there, he's got another angel who's like, all right, it's going to be okay, Daniel, uh, I don't, you're not going to die right now. Uh, and then there's Jesus up there revealing these things to Daniel, and on one side of the river there's an angel, and on the other side of the river there is another angel. And so one of those angels uh, speaks up to Jesus and asks a question. And here is how that unfolds. Daniel asks all those things. Verse 5 says this, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on the bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, How long shall it be till the end of these wonders? All these promises that you are giving to us, Jesus, uh, what's the timeline on all those things? And in verse 7, I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. You guys ever have to swear for something? Swear on the Bible or, or swear when you're making a, a promise or something like that? You guys ever seen somebody that somebody swears and they typically raise their right hand, right? Well, at this moment, uh, this character, Jesus, raises not only his right hand, but his left hand as well showing just how deeply his promises can be held. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever, that's God, that it would be for a time, times, and half a time, and that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. Now, if you're not familiar with that language, you may not sure, be sure what it means. We believe the tribulation will be about a seven-year period. And so when it says for a time, that's a year, times, that's two years, and half a time, that's half of a year. So you add those all together, that's three and a half years. He's saying this uh, portion of the tribulation is going to happen for the first half of that seven-year period. The 70th week, if you remember how we talked about the 69 weeks that have been fulfilled and the one week that is yet uh, to come. So that angel asks a question of Jesus. Now it's Daniel's turn. Daniel's like, all right, so what's going to happen after that? How's everything going to turn out? You guys ever ask that question? Ever ask that question to God? Hey, God, how's this situation going to turn out? What's going to happen after the current circumstances? What's going to happen after these things? And Daniel says, oh, my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? And Jesus communicates to Daniel, hey, you know what? Not everything that I and the Father know are for you to know right now. You can trust me. I've got plans. I've got my timing that these things are going to unfold. But I need you to close up the book close seal up uh, the, the vision the writing the, the book of daniel we're coming to the close here daniel but you can look and you can trust that i will come through in my timing here's what jesus said go your way daniel for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined but the wicked shall act wickedly those people who know God will be sanctified, will be changed, but those who are in opposition to God will continue in sin. 
None of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And from a t- the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. Now there's a lot of days there. You do the math, those are different by about 45 days. And, and uh, there are different commentators who have different ideas. Hey, maybe this is the 45 days that uh, when we go up to be with Jesus, as we're bringing him back, maybe we'll be up there at that time. I'm not sure, and uh, there's not really any, any conclusive thing I can share with you. But I believe the summary and the, the thing we need to draw from this, both the time, times, and half a time, and the 100, uh, 1,290 days, I believe that what God is communicating in here is the future is held by a God who fulfills his promises with perfect timing. And at the very end, there's one more verse for Daniel to give him courage as he lives out the rest of his life on this earth. Go your way till the end, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. Daniel, I can't tell you everything right now, but I've got a place for you, and because of what I've done in your life, you can stand in the place I have allotted for you. And it's true, brothers and sisters, every promise God will fulfill. Every timeline, he's nailing it. Perfect timing from the God of the universe. So brothers and sisters, we can live our lives in such a way knowing God has been sovereign in Daniel's lifetime. Sovereign in in those difficult moments, even in the, the lion's den. He's been sovereign all throughout history. He will be sovereign in the moment when the Antichrist shows up and and mimics in even worse ways some of the atrocities of Antiochus Epiphanes. But God is sovereign over all things, including our future. I believe I shared a quote with you uh, from uh, Corey Ten Boom earlier in this series, but I want to cap off this series with this tremendous quote. Here's a woman who experienced persecution, who was taken to a Nazi concentration camp, who was humiliated, experienced pain and shame and difficulty, but she was able to come out on the other side of that and declare these words. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. We don't know what the future holds, but we know God, we know Jesus, and we know we can trust Him. So let's walk with our God with confidence. Let's live our lives in such a way knowing God's going to deliver us no matter how bad the tribulation will be. God will raise us back to life no matter what the day of our death looks like. God will fulfill his promises to us even in his perfect timing. So brothers and sisters, yes, I encourage you, go fishing at that pond and enjoy all day out there knowing God is in control of all things. He continues to carry us forward. And yes, make those financial plans and work hard at your workplace. Study well at your uh, place of education, knowing that we can do all those things to the glory of God. And yes, also hold that phrase, too blessed to be stressed because we can cast every care on him. Because he cares for us. As we've seen over and over and over in the life of Daniel, we know God is sovereign over the seemingly small moments of our lives, but God is sovereign in such a way he is our king. He's the one who will reign forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we praise you for your rule and your reign. We thank you that not only are you in control of all things, but you are a good and loving and patient and kind God who has chosen us to know you, to walk with you, and to experience you. God, I ask that for those of us 
who are facing challenges as we look to the future, as we're worried about things, as we don't know how things are going to turn out. Lord, with those binoculars as we look to the future, Lord, may we entrust those to you. May we say, hey God, whatever the future holds, I trust you. Both now, in this life, in the coming days, and in years far down the line. Lord, even in those end times, God, we trust you in all things. And we look forward to being reunited with you, to be able to be with you and enjoy you in your presence for all eternity. We pray all these things in the powerful name of your victorious Son, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen.